Well, Happy New Year. Come on, tell somebody next to you Happy New Year if you got a. And yes, it is. I'm telling you, I, um, I started getting calls last night about this one's sick and that one's sick and worship team's sick and all these. Thankfully, most of them are flu and cold and a couple of COVID exposures. But, um, you know, church goes on. And I, I have to say that um, I'm really excited this morning. Anybody else? I'm, you know, I, I know it's raining and my wife has been home sick with the cold. But, yeah, li- come on, Brother Ralph. Liquid sunshine. Come on. First Sunday of the new year, 2022. Come on, 2021 is in the rearview mirror. Can I get an amen? It's behind us. And as I contemplated this message, I began to contemplate back through the years. And this first Sunday, year before last, and I recall I stood in this pulpit. And the Lord had given me a word. And it was not a typical New Year's word. You know, us pastors, we're supposed to get up here every year and say, oh, it's going to be a great year. God's going to be uh, just a bless you so abundant. It's going to be the best year ever. But the Lord gave me a different word, and it was before COVID. It was before all the, the social unrest. It was before all the mess we're going through today. And he said, no, he, he told me, quiet, my son. This year, I don't know if you remember, those of you who've been here a while, but that word was there's going to be a roaring. Anybody remember that? I never claimed to be a prophet, but I don't know how prophetic it was. I didn't even know what I was talking about. And I put this word out to to a congregation that was pretty quiet. What are you talking about? A roaring. What are you talking about? Banners that on one side is going to be good and the other side is going to be against you and all these things. And I didn't understand. And what what are you saying, God, to us right now? The Lord was telling me, you better better fasten your seatbelt. I'm about to do something. And I preached it, and then everything broke loose, and people come, oh, you're so prophetic, you're so pro-. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so prophetic. But I know when I hear God. And then this past New Year, on the first Sunday, I wasn't even in this pulpit. I was at, I was at home, just got out of the hospital, near death with COVID. But in that hospital, I, I shared a night, an all-night experience where I had an actual visitation with Jesus in a hospital room all night long. Woke up the next morning, totally healed. The Lord just came and he told me he had a word for me and he had a word for you. He said, I want you to know that you belong to me. I remember that. First Sunday, 2021. And it seems like for most of us in 2021, I don't know about you, but I know about me, it, it seems like it was a year of just survive. Anybody, can I get a, rel- uh, uh, amen? <laughs> Come on, just hang in there. Come on, just, just do the best you can. Uh, uh, you know, maybe a hope deferred, maybe an uncertainty. Because some things, I don't have to go down the list, just seem like they wouldn't really go away. Can I get an amen? Just, just go away. I mean, just, just stop. But they wouldn't. And I'm thankful this morning, I don't have to struggle for this word for 2022. Because it was imparted into my spirit. I have no apologies for the way that God speaks to me. He speaks to me, and anybody been around here for a while, in very, very, very dramatic ways. I guess you know that this boy has a hard head. I guess he knows, you know, I I, got to kind of believe it to see it in some things from heaven. So he sends me heavenly things to to speak a word to me over and over and over to the point of tears sometimes. Why me, God? Why me? And I know why, because he wants me to say it to you. And God gave me a new word for 2022 that this morning God imparted into my spirit in a very powerful way that I'm not going to share the way this morning. That's for another day. But today on this first Sunday of 2022, I want to impart that word into your spirit. And I want to impart that word into the spirit of New City Church. And that word is this. Write it down somewhere in capital letters. That word is expect. 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 And God told me, it's time to expect again. It's time to expect 
victory. It's time to expect, expect success. It's time to expect abundance. And I know it's a word from the Lord for 2022. For me, which means it's for you, which means it's for this church. It's time again, it's time again to do something that you and me and this church maybe haven't done in a long time, and that is to expect. And I don't know about you, I hope you are. I'm going all in on that word I've already shared with the staff and pastors. They are going all in on that word, expect. First, I received it in a very powerful and supernatural way. But then as I contemplated on that word, I went home and I, you know, began to think about, Lord, Lord, I've been in that season before. And I've seen you deliver to me and to this church in that season before. And so now I walk with you, Lord, long enough to understand that success in you does not come by simply expecting. And listen to me now before you, before you shout blasphemy. It does not even come by simply believing that God said it. I know he said it. But if I think that that, 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 that success, that victory, that abundance comes simply because I expect. Simply because I know that God said it. I'm here to tell you in the moment, that is a flawed teaching that has derailed and discouraged many Christians up until today. A lot of you looking at me like, what? Belief is essential. Faith is required. God's word written or spoken by the Holy Spirit is absolutely true. The book of Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Jesus himself in Mark, Mark 9, 23 said, All things are possible for him who believes. Belief and faith are essential, church, but they are only the first steps to getting all that God has for you. Throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, from Adam to the end, in order to activate the Word of God in your life, belief and faith must be followed by commitment. Commitment to his instructions. Commitment to his word. Commitment to his way. In other words, church, my family, you know, I kind of like it when it's a little bit thin. I don't know. I know that's strange for a pastor to say, but Crowds overwhelm me sometimes. And I find a freedom. Or should I say an easier freedom? You know, Jesus, Jesus, when he taught, he taught the most clearly when the crowds went away. Oh, I like crowds, don't get me wrong. We want all people saved. We want the church packed, amen. But I'm here to tell you this morning, this is all right with me. I trust God with his church. And I feel really, really uh, like God wants to do something powerful this morning in this church, beginning on a day like today. It's raining. 
lots of negatives outside. The crowd is a little thin. Belief and faith must be followed by another biblical principle. In addition to faith and belief, it's a critical principle. And it's a principle that's a God word. It's even one word. If you, if you didn't catch anything, I'm sure you missed it. One word in the prophetic word this morning. And that word is covenant. If you missed everything else in that prophetic word, I want you to catch this word covenant. It's very interesting as I stand back and I look at the landscape of the church around the world, but especially in America, it's very interesting. If you've been listening to preaching for a long time, and I've been listening closely now, you know, about, I'm getting older, 30 years. Maybe 20, it was kind of like late when I figured out I needed God. It was about 40, 50, 60, okay, 26 years. It's very interesting, though, as I, as I listen to the word of God out there preached, it's very interesting that in recent years, much of the church has stopped talking about covenant. Has anybody noticed that? When's the last time you heard the word covenant in a message? It's rare. And even today, when I, when I began to talk to some Christian, you know, some, some friend believers, believers about what, what I'm going to talk, what you're going to talk about, what you're going to talk about. When I say I'm going to talk about covenant, I don't get a big amen. And sometimes I even get, it's almost inhuman, this holy dread. Oh, my God. And if you look at today's culture, especially West, Western culture, it's not too difficult to figure out why. We live in a modern culture today that, that really, if you look at the news, you look at the news media, and you hear the messages, you read the books, if, if, if you are, if, if, if sadly, in if, if so many even Christian books, today's modern culture desires to hear about life without boundaries. Give me life without boundaries. And I, was like, I hear it over and over and over, and it even sounds good to me at times, uh, uh, telling me how to live, bound, live life free of any restraining powers other than the will and power of self. I was talking to a young man in, in the Apple store just a couple of days ago, uh, you know, and he's, he's, uh, I used to go to church and all that, and, you know, I'm not right now, you know, and he was really struggling, and I said, you know, what we're looking for is truth, you know, and, and, and I only found it in one place, and, and, and you know, everybody's got their truth, their truth, your truth, my truth, and, and he said, I know, I know, and he was a good little kid, and he was like, I know, and I'm, I'm sick of it, and I got to get back to church. He was telling me, this guy might have been 20, you know, and, and I said, yeah, but I said, first, find a good church. <laughs> I said, that's your first challenge. <laughs> but yeah, because there is a truth. And God's got a plan for you in that truth. But we've got, he's living in a world, and you're living in a world, and I'm living in a world today that, that, wants, that wants you to buy into this life of what the world calls freedom of any restraining boundaries. Even free of any restraining boundaries of personal morality. In other words, what they're saying, in today's society, it, it, there's a desire to live a life without covenant. Or we'll do contracts with lots of small print at the bottom. But covenant is a difference. I'll talk about that probably next week. And so what's happened in the church is I step back and I look at the landscape. In order to make church pleasing 
and comfortable in today's society. Churches have conceded to the desires of people for themselves over the desire of Christ for his bride. Conceded. Conceded to the desires of people for themselves. And the goal is to make church pleasing and comfortable to today's culture and today's society. And let me say this, it can and does produce a form of success. We watched it. It can and does produce large crowds. It can and does produce best-selling books. It can and does produce best-selling pastors. And in reality, this is, this is nothing new. It's as old as the church. It's nothing new, but it's very widespread now, primarily due to the power of the internet and the power of media. But it is as old as the New Testament church. And it's time for God's people, at least the ones in the sound of my voice, to wake up to wake up. Back in Paul's day, he wrote about this, 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 this thing, this, this, this happening, even in the, t- in the church in his day in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, listen to what he's telling Timothy as he's facing the same thing in the first churches. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. This is Paul speaking to a young pastor, Timothy. He says, some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. (coughs) Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. And such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their backs on the truth. And listen to this last sentence. To them, a show of godliness is just the way to become wealthy. Old as the church. He says some people contradict our teaching, and the teaching that he had just finished teaching was this teaching about covenant living. He said, but these are the wholesome teachers of Christ. They promote a godly life. Church is conceding, and it is very tempting. Trust me as a pastor, I can tell you, it is very tempting to concede to the desires of people for themselves over the desires of Christ for his bride. It's nothing new. It's an old deception. A few weeks ago, I shared with you all a personal prayer time of mine when I was on vacation down in Florida with my wife. And I want to go back to that just for a moment. And And when I got down there, I asked God on the first day, you know, I said, Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. I was beginning to look back over 2021. Lord, speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Because I knew I had to come back and preach. (laughs) I knew this year was closing last year. I I need to hear your voice. What are you saying to your church today? And I asked God, what do you want from me? It was was almost like a, a, anybody had those kind of talks with God? What do you want from me? What else do you want from me? What do you want from this church? 
And I shared that on a few days later, was, I was standing on the balcony of, of our hotel room and, and looking out, it was a rainy, stormy day, and looking at these waves crashing on the beach, and I heard those three words speaking over and over in, in the waves. The words were number one, kingdom, covenant, and possession. Kingdom, covenant, and possession. What do you want from me? Kingdom, covenant, possession. What do you want from us? Kingdom, covenant, possession. And as I broke those words down, I know the possession in the Word of God is the divine intent of God, is the purpose of, of kingdom, is the purpose of this covenant we're talking about today, that man will be his and his alone in his presence and his habitation. He wants to possess you, and he wants you to possess all of him. Kingdom is, the, is our priest, is that realm of existence where God alone rules. He rules exclusively. He rules exclusively. Explicitly by his three things, his name, his explicit name, his explicit presence, and his explicit word, the Bible. No other powers in this world they have any rule in it, even though we try to inject some of that into no political party, no social cause, no national identity, no racial identity, no opinions or decrees of man. It's a realm of existence where God alone rules exclusively and explicitly by his name, by his word, and by his presence. And if you call our priest, if any one of those three is absent, it is not the kingdom of God. And that word covenant, a kingdom word, a binding promise, a promissory agreement, a commitment, devotion, and allegiance. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that too many churches, too many pastors have purged from their vocabulary. Covenants. It's a binding state of relationship with God. You know, one of, one of, one of my greatest desires in this world, and God put this into me very, almost the first day I got saved, and I would walk in those doors, still struggling with drugs in the closet, knowing that Jesus loved me and I love Jesus, but just still struggling in so many areas. God put something in me about the people of God around me. I, I just always had this burning desire from when I was working out there on that parking lot, and then an usher. Always, I always desired to see the, the people that God God placed around me the people of God successful. I had this burn in me that even though I was feeling so much guilt for my sin, even if, I, even if I'm not successful, Lord, I love seeing the people of God successful because they are proving to me that your word is true. I love to see you successful. I love to see you prosper even to this day. But allow me, allow me, if I will, to give you my personal definition of success. My personal definition of prosperity. And I know it's a biblical definition. And it may not line up with your definition, but here's my definition. Success to me, and I believe success in God, is that you have everything you need to do what God called you to do. Success. I mean, the, the, the real success is that God, you receive from God everything that you need to do what God called you to do. If you look in the Bible, King Solomon was certainly successful and prosperous. Let me say also, John the Baptist was certainly successful and prosperous. Come on, King David was certainly successful and prosperous. But let me say also, that Samarian woman at the well was certainly successful, and prosperous. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me this morning? I think I got to shake some old bad teaching out of some of us this morning. 
And what that is saying, I want you to hear it closely. Success, listen, success is declarative, not comparative. Say it again. This is just for you, Pastor Zach. Success is declarative, not comparative. In other words, success is not determined by material comparison to someone else. True success is an individual marriage measurement according to God's declaration, not man's metrics. I'm preaching the word of God to you this morning. Let me say that again. True success is an individual measurement according to God's declaration, not according to the metrics of man. My desire for each and every one of you in 2022 is that, is that you are absolute success, absolutely successful according to God's measurements. You see, man's measurement would never bring you true peace. Man's measurement would never bring you contentment. Man's measurement would never bring you real joy. And in the end, I'm here to tell you, man's measurements in heaven are meaningless. At the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, at the end of the book, a King Solomon who wrote that book, now he's a very old man. And he's looking back over his life. He's looking back over his life under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because it's in the Bible, he's looking back over his life, and he's personally experienced the highest of highs. He's had it all in wealth and riches. He's, he's had it all. And he's also experienced the lowest of lows and moral failures. And he's looking back over his life, and if you read that book, it's a, it's a, oh my goodness, what a read. But, but the first 11 chapters, all he talks about is, is the meaningless of man's measurements and the goodness of God's measurements. And then his last work, his last word in that book was a profound statement. And it was, it was even prophetic toward the common Messiah and it, it, it's what he calls the conclusion to the matter. In Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 14. And he says, and moreover, and moreover, after, after I've talked to you about the meaningless of man's measurements and the goodness of God's measurements, and he says, and moreover, because the preacher was wise. And when he says preacher, he's talking about himself. Because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. He wrote a lot of them. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth, inspired by the Holy Spirit because he wrote them in the Bible. The words of the wise are like ghosts and like prodders and, and, or prodders, and, and words of the scholars are like well-driven nails. They provide a boundary of fastening given by one, he said, capital S, shepherd. Old Testament. And further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books. There is no end. We got a bunch of books being made. Can I get an amen? And much study is wearisome to the flesh. And in verse 13, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He 
He said the words of the wise are like goats. Goats kind of prod a sheep and, and, and keep, a, keep a flock of sheep together. So, and the words of scholars, he's seen godly scholars like well-driven nails that set the place right where they need to be in drive, and they set, set, they fasten something together. And he said, and, and he said, given by one capital S shepherd. He didn't know he was talking about Jesus. And then after all his riches, after all his ups and downs, after all his wisdom, after, after all his idol worshiping and worshiping God at the same time and, 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 and trying to be the holy man, but he, he couldn't keep his hands off hundreds of foreign women, the Bible says. It's tough being the king. And he said, even after all this, at an old age, he said, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is man's all. I expect, and I do expect, success for everyone, and the sound of my voice, everyone in this room, everyone that's online, that's not here sick or whatever, every, everyone, I expect success. I expect more success for myself. And God clearly gave me that word for 2022, and he gave it to me clearly and in a powerful way. That it's time again to expect. Expect victory. Expect success. Expect abundance. But I've also learned and I have witnessed and I've personally experienced in seasons of my life the real victory, real success, real abundance, the best God has for you and the best God has for me and the best God has for this church is only found living life in the margins and boundaries of his covenant. Covenant. I saw a magazine cover just recently laying on the table. And I looked at it, and it was in big print. And it was declaring, a secular magazine, declaring year 2022 as the year of radical self-care. And I looked at that, and I said, Jesus, would you buy that magazine? Paul, would you buy it? Peter? John, PG, covenant living makes you stronger. Covenant living brings stability to your life. Covenant living brings protection to your life. Covenant living activates the promises of God in your life. Covenant living causes you to bear fruit. Covenant living builds the church, covenant living 
builds the kingdom. It's time to expect. It's time, church, to expect victory, expect success, expect abundance. By God's measurement, not man's metrics. But I know this for sure by the word of God. The first thing that we have to do in 2022, this is the word of the Lord to me to you. We've got to reset our hearts to the biblical principle of covenant living. And so beginning this week, we're going to be looking deeper into the Word of God on this essential principle of living for Jesus. Come on, are you with me, church? You got to set your hearts on it because it's something that's been pressed out of society, pressed out of culture, and sadly pressed out of the church. Is pressed out of everywhere except the Bible. You can't press it out of the Word of God. I can't wait to go deeper into covenant. I also would be, want to begin this first Sunday of 2022, and I want to go back and look again. I have to I refresh myself and refresh the church again. I remember when I became the, the lead pastor uh, coming up on 11 years ago now, and I was asked, what's the vision of the church? And we had a big fancy vision statement, and we read it, read it, read it, and turned it upside down. I don't know if you remember, just those eras where all these churches were bringing their own vision statement, you know, and we'd write it out and think about it and pray about it. Somebody add something else in. We added so much in it, and, and, and we couldn't even figure out what it meant anymore, you know. And I just went home because everybody's looking at me. I'm this new, new lead pastor. I'm just, you know what? No, well, what, what? Give me something new. And he said, I'm not going to give you something new. I'm going to give you something old. And he sent me to Ephesians chapter 4. So just I think it's good to begin this year with a, a, a look back and a look forward. Some things have to be immovable in a church. I even tell our staff, you know, don't, you, you, can, you, can, you can change the look of the car. We can change the paint. We can change the decoration. We, you, you know, I'm going back to, to, to David and, and, and the cart bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, back, back, back to Jerusalem. You can change the cart. I don't mind to put some LED lights on it, do all that stuff, you know, mic it up, whatever. Change the cart, but don't change what's in it. Some things have to be immovable. And here's what God gave me when he said, well, what's the, the, the vision of the church? And again, it's Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus. And right now he's planted that church, but right now he's in prison. He's, he's in home, home confinement because of the word of the Lord. It's not an easy day for the church, not an easy day for him. But he speaks in Ephesians 4, and I'm going to read 1 through 16. And I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation just to freshen up for you. It says, Therefore I, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, a prisoner for serving the Lord. Grab hold of that. Beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. That's you. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Where did that go? Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. Where did that go? 
For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended into the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world, to this earth. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the pastors, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers, the prophets. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. There's where we grab our vision statement in verse 12. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And he says, this will continue till we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That's the goal. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about every wind of, of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Can I get an amen? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of this body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And that is the vision statement of New City Church. The apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, my responsibility, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Covenant living builds the church. Covenant living builds the kingdom and covenant living builds your life and we're going to talk about my covenant but today I want you to get something in your heart a word in your heart and that word is expect come on tell somebody expect come on tell them expect success come on tell them loud I don't think they heard you I don't think they believe tell them expect success expect victory Expect abundance. I can tell you're not convinced yet, but I believe over the weeks you're going to be convinced. Expect. It took me a minute to eat it. It's time to expect again. I want us to take a minute in prayer, and then we're going to go into communion. And I don't think it's a prayer for somebody else. I think it's a prayer for yourself this morning. We're just going to take one or two minutes. And I want you to pray that this expectancy becomes you. your vision for you. Let's just take a quiet minute or two.
Hallelujah. Come on, if you would take the bread. If you didn't get an emblem and you came in, just raise your hand. Somebody bring. Just hold it. Up front, up here as well. tell when you're ready we don't hear the the, uh, the paper anymore come on together now. The Bible says on, on the night Jesus was betrayed, the very night that he took the bread, and the Bible says he gave thanks in that upper room with his disciples. And he said, take and eat. And he said, this is my body, which will be broken for you. And when it was broken for us, taking all our sin upon him. He said, I'm going to, it's for you. And he said, just, just, just do this together. This, this is a covenant act right here, really. Remembering his broken body for us. Come on, let's partake of the bread. And then all together, let's take the cup, hold on. And he said, this cup, he said, at first he gave thanks for his blood that was about to be shed. And he said, this, this represents a new covenant. Come on, there it is. A new covenant in his way. Thank God for his new covenant. Let's partake together. And he said, whatever you do this, and it was, it was a strange statement in the Bible. He said, do this remembering my death. Until I come again. Come on, we have that salvation prayer. Let's put it up real quickly. If there's anybody in this room that does not know Jesus, as your Lord and Savior, what a great day to do so. And if that's you at the end of this service, we're going to recite this together. We're going to pray this. I shouldn't say recite. I never want to become just a reciting. For the first time, it's a prayer of salvation. For the rest of us, yeah, it's, it's uh, over and over in our spirit so that when we go out, and you're talking to somebody and they want to receive Christ, Holy Spirit leads you, you you'll kind of know how to lead them. That's why we do it this way. It's equipping you for the work of God out there. And it doesn't have to be in these words, but there's a pattern, there's a way, there's some necessary things that must be said in the heart. So let's, but let's just repeat this together. Thank you, Jesus for dying on the cross for me. I know that I am a sinner and I repent for my sins. 
come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Today I have been made new from this day forward. I will follow you. And the church said, amen. Amen, church. I love you so much. Happy New Year. Let's walk into it. Come on. With what? Expectancy. Come on. Come on. Say it again. Expectancy. Come on. A little louder this time. Expectancy. Come on. Expect. Come on. Expect. Anybody other than me expecting victory? I mean, anybody other than me? Do I have? Come on. Come on. I I don't care what the weather is outside. You know? I don't care if my wife is at home sick with a cold. I mean, I expect healing. I expect success. It's time to expect again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.